I'm Rick Whitlow, and this is my wife, Beth, and um, we've been going to Journey for about two and a half years. And one of the reasons why we chose to give to Build Project was we wanted to leave a legacy behind um, for future families. We raised our family here in this area, and so we're really excited about wanting to leave that behind for future families and kids and grandkids. So we both uh, agreed on how much to give and uh, came up with the same numbers. It was just nice that there wasn't a tension about it. It was, we both went, okay, done, fill out the card. So we had a real estate property that um, we have for retirement and um, a gentleman had been renting from us for a couple of years. And um, all of a sudden, I, we believe he got COVID and lost his job. And so he quit paying rent and um, we were trying to work with him. We had a management company that was um, dealing with it. And um, anyways, he wasn't able to pay rent for months and months and months. And uh, all of a sudden, three weeks after we turned in our build commitment card, um, the money was deposited into our account for past rent. And it was within a few hundred dollars of uh, what we committed to. And both of us just sat down and went like, we can't believe this. It was so cool and it was such a, a gift from God. And uh, it was amazing to see that God's hand working in all that. You know, I mean, I, we sacrificed in our hearts, but then it came back to us. In our case, there's a piece about it and, and God basically uh, met our specific need very quickly and easily and, and there wasn't really a fear on her part or mine. Well, I, I think we've learned that God is always there and will always honor your choices and your decisions that you make. I think what I've liked so much about Journey is that my husband and I were raised in uh, strict homes and strict um, churches and it has given us a freedom in Christ. We have experienced so much mercy and grace, even at this age in our lives, um, that we didn't have before. Hey, good morning, everybody. Welcome to church. So glad that you're here. If it happens to be your first time with us, my name is Scotty. I'm going to be teaching in just a few moments. I want to welcome everybody to our church. I want to welcome everybody who's watching online today, hundreds of you. And then also want to welcome our Highlands Ranch location. Can you guys help me welcome the Highlands Ranch location? So glad that you're with us today. Hey, if it happens to be your first time here and you'd like a little bit more information about our church, there's a connect card. It's at the bottom of the note-taking outline you received when you came in. You can fill out as much as you're comfortable with. And at the end of the service today, there'll be ushers who'll standing out in the atrium with buckets, and you can drop it in there when, they, when, you, when you exit the building. I always tell people that just fill out as much as you're comfortable with, and we'll, we'll send you uh, some information about our church and how you can take a step to get involved. Uh, if it is your first time here today, you're, you're here on a very special day. Uh, we're celebrating the one year anniversary of what we call Build. And our church continues to grow and more and more people are coming and, and we're trying to make room for more. And so last year about this time, I asked our church to consider stepping into this, what we call the Build Initiative, where people give above and beyond what they normally give for their tithes and offerings to help make this a reality. And we're, we're gonna build here at the Castle Pines location doubling our square footage. We're adding a new auditorium with more seating, doubling our kids and student space, and then also preparing to launch future locations of our church. This was all in uh, February of last year. And people came forward and made commitments toward that, saying, hey, I'm going to give over a two-year period above and beyond what I normally give to help make this a reality. I had just asked people to ask God, what, what should we do individually and as families? And so people came forward and, and made commitments. The goal for the project to build the building 
and to set us up to launch future locations is $8 million. As many of you know who attend here regularly, we met and exceeded that goal in commitments. Uh, and so far, people have continued to give sacrificially over this last year to help make that uh, a possibility. But we're celebrating a one-year anniversary, one, to thank everyone who's giving sacrificially uh, this year. Uh, over $5.5 million has already been given toward the project, which is incredible. Uh, thank you for your unbelievable generosity. Generosity. If you're here at the Castle Pines location, you can see that the construction's happening. It's going quickly. And then we were able to launch the Highlands Ranch location on the Sunday after Labor Day, and it's going incredible as well. Uh, so we're also today inviting, there are hundreds of new people who started attending our church in the last year, that this is your church family now, and you weren't able to be a part of that moment. And, and what we're asking today is, and we've been asking over the last couple of weeks, is for people to ask God, what should we do to be a part of this over the next year? In other words, new people making a one-year commitment to say, we're going to give because this is our church. When we walk walk into the building at Castle Pines or when we visit one of the other locations. We want to be a part of that because it's our church family. And so many of you have been praying about that. And today is something called Commitment Sunday. And so this helps us with our planning purposes. It's kind of a holy moment for people to put a stake in the ground and say, yes, I want to be a part of this. At the end of the service today, I gave you a little commitment card there in your chair. Also, if you're brand new, there's a little brochure to explain a little bit more about the project. For those of us who've come prepared today, at the end of the service, I'm going to invite you to come and place your commitment card into a container. We're going to sing a song. People will stand and people will come down the aisles and place their commitment card into containers. And the commitment card is for a one-year commitment. So those of us who made a commitment last year, like my family and I, we're filling out one just for this next calendar year saying this is what we've already given, but this is what we plan to give this year. And then there are dozens, hundreds of people who have started to attend our church who want to make a commitment today for one year. You'll be making a new commitment. So at the end of the service today, we'll have a special time to do that here at Castle Pines, there at Highlands Ranch, and you can also do it online. Uh, if you make a commitment today, uh, when you leave, we have these bricks. They're like just a commemorative brick. It's not anything incredibly special other than it represents the commitment that we, that so many of us have made to help make room for more to help people find their way home to God. And many of you probably have one of these sitting in your home, like on a mantle or a shelf. And every time I look at it, I just pray for our church. I, I think about all of you who are sacrificing and giving so that people can have a church home. And so you can grab one of those on the way out. And then if you're here at the Castle Pines location, we have pieces of sheetrock set up where you can sign your name. And they're going to go into the new building. And they'll get painted over. But your name and your prayers will be written there on the sheetrock underneath the paint. So isn't that, isn't that cool? So, so glad that you're here today. We're going to jump into some teaching today. So let's pray and get ourselves ready. So God, we just come before you. Uh, it's a special day um, in the life of our church, but more than just making commitments and having a special celebration, what's even more special is that you have something to say to us today, that every single person gathered in a room or watching online, you know them and you know their needs and you know their struggles and you know their pain. You know where they need encouragement or hope. And I'm just praying, God, that we would get into a position to listen. Help us to do that today. To push out all the distraction and everything that's coming next. And let us fight for this moment. If you're open to hearing from God today, I just invite you to pray this very simple prayer that we pray every time we gather together as a church. If you're new, it's just a quiet, sincere prayer between you and God, something like this. God, would you please speak to me today because I'm listening. And then pray for somebody else, probably somebody you're seated beside, somebody in your family, somebody you came to church with today. A simple prayer for them, something like this. God, please talk to this person today and give them the faith and the courage to respond to you. In Jesus' name, everybody said... Amen. Hey, to start the message out today, the, we've been doing this collection of talks called The Way. Uh, we, were, we got 
this week and then we're wrapping up next week. But to start the message out today, I just, I just have a question for you. How many of you regularly lie to your dentist? Would you just raise your hand? <laughs> just, are you with me? How many of you know that you should floss, but you don't? And then when your hygienist or your dentist asks you about that, you leave your Christianity at the door and you straight out lie <laughs> to them. Oh yeah, all the time, every day, three times a day, normally. And you know this person who looks in hundreds of mouths is like, you're a liar. <laughs> I say that because we all know we should floss, but then necessarily don't. Because what we know doesn't always make its way to what we do. And that's what we've been talking about in this collection of messages here at Journey called The Way. We've been talking about what does it look like to take our faith and put it into action. Not to just have these mental beliefs or ideas, but to take what we know and turn it into something that really matters. Here's our theme verse. If you're taking notes, I want to encourage you to grab that note-taking outline. Write some things down. Circle some words with me. Jesus comes to a group of men, and in this particular instance, they're fishermen, they're, they're blue-collar guys, they've been working all night, and he says, I want you to come and follow me. Now, this was a normal thing that they would have seen in their culture where a rabbi or a teacher would invite disciples, learners to come and follow them, but these guys, they had been overlooked. They, they had not been chosen by other rabbis, and so they thought, that's not in the cards for me, but Jesus, the ultimate rabbi, comes to them and says, says, come follow me. Now, belief is implied in that, but it, it takes action to follow someone. He says, I want you to come and follow me. I will make you into something. We're going to practice some things. We're going to develop some things. And it says that once they left their nets and they followed him. Now, leaving their nets behind is significant and important. Why? Because it represents their lifestyle, their trade. It represents what they do for a living. They're leaving some things behind. And the call to follow Jesus is always challenging and uncomfortable because it leads us to different places. And the reason why Jesus continually leads us back to this action-oriented lifestyles because it makes, it makes such a big difference. Look at what James says. This is in the book of James. And James is the brother of Jesus, grows up in the home with Jesus. If you've attended here for any amount of time, I've said this before, but can you imagine what it's like to grow up in the house with Jesus? Like your mom and dad are always like, hey, could you just be more like Jesus? And that leads to friction. We know from church history that James doesn't become a follower of Jesus until after the resurrection. Like he's not included in the original group of disciples because what would you have to do to convince your brother that you're God? <laughs> like rise from the dead, right? I mean, it's the only thing. And he says this, this is very important. The guy who's witnessed and watched Jesus his entire life. He says, in the same way, faith by itself, if it's not accompanied by action, is what? Say it with me. Dead. He's like, these ideas of what it means to be a follower of Christ, if they don't make their way into our lives, it's, it's kind of useless. It's dead. It doesn't matter. And in fact, a watching world is constantly looking to see Hey, is what you say, does it match up with your life? We live in a world that loves to shout and, 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 and say our opinions. We all have a microphone because we have an iPhone. Like we just say, here's what I think about that. The world is looking for people who say, can you, can you back that up with what you do? Why? Because the difference is in the doing. In fact, if you've been here for the last few weeks, we've said this, that the name for Christianity in the early church was called the way, the people of the way, not what they say, their way. So we've been talking about, and we'll continue to talk about here at Journey, the habits of what it looks like to follow Jesus, regular, intentional, consistent behavior that matches up with what we say we believe because it the difference is in the doing. 
And man, we've talked about everything from fasting to prayer to generosity to scripture last week. And today we're going to talk about one other big idea, the habits of service and sacrifice. We group them together because they go together. One is required for the other. The habits, intentional habits of service and sacrifice. So if you have a Bible or you have your smartphone, you want to pull it up and follow along with me, we're going to read some scripture together today. We're going to have it on the screen. We're going to, it's also on your outline. And we're going to walk through one of the most familiar stories in the scripture. And to set it up, Jesus has gone to an upper room with his disciples. This is during Passover, which is a religious ceremony. Uh, it was celebrating the, the people of Israel escaping from Egypt because God had passed over uh, them and brought them out and into a promised land. And so they're celebrating that. It's a close inner circle. It's the closest disciples of Jesus, a small group. And this, in this room, things Jesus is doing his final teaching right? Because he's about to go to the cross. Uh, he's talking about the Lord's Supper, communion that gets instituted, and then what we're going to read about today. Uh, I didn't put it on your outline, but last night when I was reading, rereading this passage, because on Saturday night, I'll reread the passage and pray about it and think about it for us uh, one more time. I, I, I stopped on a, a little verse in, in the first verse of chapter 13. I didn't put it on the outline. We added it to the screens because sometimes when, when I'm reading a verse or getting ready for Sunday, I just have this impression that God wants me to say a little something to somebody here in the room. And I try to be sensitive to that. And sometimes, sometimes when I read a verse, it will just pop off the page to me. And it might just be for one person here, but I felt like I should read it. It's just a setup verse for what we're going to read. But I, I love this last part. Look at what it says. It says, it was just before the Passover festival and Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to leave this world and go to his father. In other words, he's headed to the cross. And here's what I want, here's what I want us to concentrate on today. Having loved his own who were in the world, and this is this last part, he loved them to, to the end. Now, maybe you want to write that down and go back and look at it later, but I just got stuck on this last part, and Jesus loved them to the end. It's the end for him because he's headed to the cross, but I just thought maybe somebody needed to hear that today, that Jesus loves you to the end that he will never leave you, that he will never forsake you, that whatever you're struggling with, no matter how far you have fallen, Jesus will love you to the end. There's not a lot of people who will go to the end of the line with us, but Jesus is saying, I will go to the end of the line with you all the way to the end. Now that's just a crab cake. That's just a little appetizer. That's not even the real message, but I just thought somebody might need to hear that today. Let's look at this verse, verse number three in John chapter 13. It says, Jesus knew that the father had put all things under his power and that he had come from God and was returning to God. Translation, Jesus knew who he was. Jesus is leading this moment with the disciples. Jesus is the son of God. He is the king of kings, the Lord of lords. And if anybody deserves to be served, it's Jesus. All power and all authority are with him. Now in our world, every single person that we know and every person in this room and every person you've ever locked eyes with is trying to be more important than they are. But Jesus is the most important, highest status. And then the very next word, because he knows all this, the very next word is the word so. So because of this, he got up. He got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, and wrapped a towel around his waist. And most of you who've grown up in church know where this is going, but this would have been a very strange moment for the disciples. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with a towel that was wrapped around him. Now let's, let's stop and talk about this for a moment. This is, this is so powerful. In the time of Jesus, uh, people would come to a home for a meal. 
would come to a home for a meal and maybe they would get ready and dress and wash themselves and they would, would come to the home, but they had walked in what? In sandals. And when they get there on these dusty roads, their feet were, let's come on, nasty. And so as they come in, this is, this is so critical and maybe you've heard this before, but the person responsible for washing the feet was the person who was, had the lowliest status in the home. They were typically a servant or a slave. The lowest servant or slave was responsible for bending and stooping and washing the feet of the guest. Typically, people would just completely ignore them as they wiped and washed their feet. They were just background. So, as they are gathered around the table, and don't think like your Thanksgiving table. Think there's cushions, and they're laying down, they're reclining. So their feet, they're facing one another, kind of on their stomachs or sides, and their feet are all out like in a U shape. So Jesus gets up, and as he starts to take off this outer garment, they know what's happening. He grabs the towel, and then he grabs the basin, and everyone else or in the group, they're just shocked by this. Are you kidding me? The one who is the son of God, the one who has all authority and all power, the one that we have seen calm the storm and raise the dead is about to kneel down and wash our feet. And everyone is silent except for Peter. He's a loud mouth. I relate with him. I understand this man. He feels like I need to say something. And he says, are you going to wash my feet? Are you serious? You'll, no, 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 you'll never wash my feet. And he's trying to like, he's trying to keep Jesus from doing that. But in the middle of that, he's being prideful. He's telling the son of God what to do, by the way. No, 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 you don't know what you're doing here. And then Jesus quietly says to him, hey, I have to do this. And you don't understand right now, but you will. Because Peter grows up and in life and in adulthood and in ministry and by the end of his life is a servant of the church. Is He dies a martyr's death. Church history says that he was crucified upside down for his faith. So he says, one day you'll understand what I'm trying to do here. He says, I, I, I wanna show you something. And if I, if I don't wash your feet, you don't really have any part in what we're doing. And then Peter He's always one extreme or the other. Does anybody live with somebody like that? Uh, don't look at him. Don't look at him. <laughs> he says, well, then wash me all over. Spray me down. And Jesus is like, we don't, we don't need to do that. We don't need to do that. And he starts to wash his feet, washes the rest of their feet. Oh, this is so good. Look at what verse 13 says. He says, you call me teacher and Lord, and rightfully so, for that's what I am. Now, what is that? You say, I'm a Christian. You say, you're the Lord. You say, I'm a follower of Jesus, and rightfully so, because that's what I am. He says, now, now that your Lord and your teacher have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. Jesus keeps pointing back to, listen, to be a follower of Jesus means that we walk around with towels in our hands, ready to serve. He says this, I have set an example that you should do as I have done for you. Verse 16 says, very truly, I tell you, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. He says, if I do this, come on, you should. I'm the only one in this circle. I'm actually the only one to ever live that deserves to be served, but I don't. I choose to serve instead. Jesus would say it like this. I did not come to be served, but to serve. Like that's, and I want you to follow that example. He goes on to teach them about what it means to be leaders and not to lord over leadership over people. He says, but to be, to be servants of people. How many of you, uh, when you were growing up, when you would act a little proud, big time, your mom or your dad would say something to you like, you act a little too big for your britches. You ever, you ever had anybody say that? 
Maybe that's a Southern thing. I don't know. But they were just like, hey, who do you think you are? Who, who do you? And Jesus says that to us. Like, who, who do you think you are? In a kind way. Who do we think? We, we think we are followers of Jesus. So we are servants of all. Look, this, this could be the theme verse for the entire series. Look at it in verse 17. Now that you say these words with me, now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you come on, do them. Again, we're back to the flossing. You've seen this. Your feet were washed. You know this. You will be blessed if you do them. Now, servant leadership has become popular in business circles. You might have been to a seminar where someone got up and talked about being a servant leader. That really comes from this idea of Jesus. But this would have been a radical thought for the people in the times of Jesus. And he says, listen, if you want to follow me, I want you to understand something. This is so important. I, I'm never more like Jesus than when I'm serving. I'm never more like Jesus when I'm putting someone else's needs ahead of mine, in your family, in your community, in your neighborhood, at the office, at our church, I'm never more like Jesus than when I'm serving. I love this quote from Martin Luther King Jr. It says, everybody can be great because everybody can serve. Everybody can say, you first. So let's talk about a couple of elements of this. In order to serve, we have to sacrifice. And what is sacrifice? Sacrifice is the surrender of something valuable for the sake of something better. Sacrifice, in order for it to really be sacrifice, means I'm giving something up with the thought that what I'm investing is that it will, I'm giving that for something to be better my marriage and, and my family and my community and my church, I am sacrificing because this matters. So let's talk about a few areas of sacrifice, the ones that I think are the real sticking points for, for me and probably for you. Areas of sacrifice. Here's one, uh, money. Money, we talked about this a couple of weeks ago. We talked about generosity uh, and, and how important it is for us to be open-handed people and to live sacrificially when it comes to our finances. That something happens inside of us when we do that. In fact, hundreds of you in this room and at Highlands Ranch and watching online are incredibly sacrificial in your giving because you believe that by investing that, it leads to something better. People are giving and have been for over a decade here at Journey, 16 years, where people have been giving and sacrificing to say, we want to make room for more. We want, we want to build a community that's life-giving and invites people home into a relationship with God. And we sacrifice because we think it's leading to something better. But it's always a moment of, is this, can I let this go? Can I let this go? Will this lead to, to something better? Yesterday... We're keeping our granddaughter this weekend. Uh, her name is Collins. Uh, it's amazing. You're probably like, you look way too young to be a granddad. And uh, <laughs> really, uh, hey, don't laugh too hard. Uh, we're keeping our granddaughter this weekend because my son and daughter-in-law are leading our high school ministry retreat. We've got dozens of students up in the mountains, high school students. And, and we said, hey, we'll, we'll take care of granddaughter. Yesterday afternoon, uh, I, I said, I need to go get some gas. I'm going to take Collins. That's her name. I'm going to take Collins with me. And so I said, hey, Collins, you want to go? And my granddad name is Bear. And I said, hey, you want to go with Bear to go get some gas? And she's eight months old. So she's up for it. She's ready to go. And... <laughs> So we get into that. We're going to go get some gas in the car. My wife says, hey, I'm going to go with you. And as we go, we're, we're driving into Castle Rock. We're going to go get Sam's gas because it's always cheap, uh, cheaper. Uh, and there's always 900 people there trying to save 13 cents. So I'm, I'm with them. And uh, she, on the way there, she tricked me. On the way there, she said, what if you drop me and Collins off at TJ Maxx? <laughs> Man, I fell for it. Uh, so I dropped them off, come back to get them up. We've got a cart. How many ladies got carts at TJ Maxx coming out with Easter stuff for Collins? I told you all that because we sacrificed some money for Collins because she's something better. Okay, here's another sacrifice. Sacrificing our preference. 
It's really important, guys. This is, this is really, I, I need to say this to our church, is as a follower of Jesus involved in a church, we all have preferences. Preferences about, hey, what time's the service? And where I'm going to sit? And what, what songs that they play? And how they do this and how they do that? And we get comfortable in those preferences. I have, I have my preferences. Like I, I'm, I'm to the age now that I decide whether or not I'm going to go to a restaurant by how loud it is. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? Like, can we hear each other? And uh, yeah, what time it's going to be? All those kinds of things. I have my preferences. But listen, I'm, I'm talking to people who are like my age and older. Like I'm, I'm 40, 47, headed to 48. And, and so we have to be constantly thinking as a church about how do we hand the baton of faith off to the next generation. And sometimes what, what happens in the activities of kids and students and younger adults and music and that, sometimes we have to lay our preferences on altars and say, God, I'm going to... I'm going to sacrifice that because I, if that's what you're doing in the lives of young people, I, I want to be a part of that. I've experienced this so much in my life because I was a youth pastor and I'd be working with middle school and high school students. And in those days, a lot of great things were happening. But if you get hundreds of teenagers together, crazy things happen. Things get broken. Things get dirty. And I would, I would get emails from older people in our church going, I can't believe you let these kids act like this and this. And the building was all dirty and messed up. And, and I found a verse in Psalms that says, uh, excuse me, in Proverbs, it says, the empty stable stays clean, but the empty stable is no profit. And I would just email that back to them. <laughs> I'd love to have clean, empty buildings and every kid go to hell. That's what you're saying. I have more of a filter now. <laughs> but as a young man, I related with Peter. Sometimes we have to have preferences that go, I'm going to lay that on the altar because I, I want to see things happen. And, and there are people at our church who, who they lay down preferences every week. There are people who come to earlier services or, 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 or ride a shuttle every week or, or, hey, I live in the Highlands Ranch area, so I'm going to the Highlands Ranch location. Why? Because, because I'm going to lay down my preferences to help make room for more. So here's another one, sacrificing our time. This may be the, one of the most challenging ones, right? Is because that it really affects us, our time. In our community, I, I have found that many people are more willing to sacrifice money than time. Like, hey, I'll give to that, but I'm not sure if I'll show up and help. I'm not sure if I'll, because my time is incredibly valuable, but our time really, our calendar and our time, it reveals some things that are really important to us. Here's why I put all these things up here about areas of sacrifice is because Jesus will constantly lead us into places that are uncomfortable, where, where we have to take on the posture of a servant. Why? Because he's trying to remind us of some things and he's saying, hey, this is what your master does and, and, and this is what you should do. In fact, write this down with me. We have a faith that is symbolized by a cross. If we believe the path of our faith is free of sacrifice, we are fooling ourselves. If we think following Jesus will never require me to lay some things down, like money, preference, time, I'm fooling myself. So many times we want the benefits of following Jesus without any of the cost. But Jesus says, that's kind of impossible. Take up your cross. Let's go. So let's talk about a couple areas of serving uh, very particularly. One is spontaneous. And here's what I mean by that. Being willing to be inconvenienced. That I might spontaneously serve someone and being willing to be inconvenienced. I don't know if anything bothers me more in the world than being inconvenienced. Does anybody relate with that? Like, I'm a person who's like, hey, I'm going from A to B, and I'm going to get there as quickly as possible. And if you interrupt me, whoo, don't point at your spouse. I saw you. You're like, this person's like, he's talking about you. 
spontaneous, this moment of I'm willing to be inconvenienced. Uh, over this week, I, I, I started reading through and studying the Gospels, thinking about it in this framework, about how many times Jesus was interrupted. Did you know that like 90 something percent of the miracles, the message, the teaching, the power moments of Jesus were as a result of interruptions? We think interruptions happen on our way to real life. And Jesus was saying real life happens in the interruptions. Jesus was interrupted when he was sleeping. At one point he's sleeping on a boat, trying to get a little rest between ministry things. Disciples wake him up. There's a storm. We're going to die. <laughs> Another point, Jesus is eating. Lady bursts in the door and starts to put perfume on his feet. She's a prostitute. Stops the meal, loves on her. Moments over and over again where Jesus is traveling from one place to the next where somebody interrupts him and he stops. Not inconvenienced, not angry, not frustrated. Hey, hey, listen, and this might be for you today. You are never an inconvenience or an interruption to the Son of God. Sometimes we think, man, he's so busy running the universe. What, I mean, what, what, is, what does he have time to do? You're never an interruption. One time, Jesus gets off a boat from a ministry trip, trying to get to another place where he's going to do some more ministry, and a guy interrupts him. His name is Jarius, and he says, my daughter is sick. Would you please come heal her? And Jesus interrupted, leaves there, starts to go to Jarius' house. On the way there, a crowd forms, and as the crowd forms, a lady stops him. Now imagine if you're the dad, and Jesus gets stopped. Hey, hold, hold, wait, wait a minute. I, had the, I was first in line. And he says, this woman just touched me. And all the disciples say, everybody's touching you. We're in a crowd. And he goes, no, 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 no. It's different than that. This woman touched me. And it says that this woman has this issue of blood, which meant that she was hemorrhaging. And she'd been hemorrhaging for 12 years. And she thought to herself, if I could just get close enough and touch Jesus, maybe he, he, he would heal me. And even the fact that she touches him, she... She was unclean by their law, which meant if she touched Jesus, she would make him unclean, which meant he would have to sit out for like seven days of ritual and all these kinds of things. But she was so desperate, she reaches out to touch him. Jesus isn't angry. He, oh, maybe some of the best words in the Bible, Jesus stops. Who touched me? Woman, your faith has healed you. Then he goes to the guy's house. The little girl died. Can you imagine the father going, are you serious? If that lady had not stopped us. No, no, no. Interruptions are part of the real life of Jesus. I want to spontaneously serve. He heals the girl, brings her back. All of the ministry of Jesus is about interruption. But anytime I'm inconvenienced, I'm angry. And Jesus says, stop. Because we're people of the towel. We stop and serve. And this, and we'll, we'll wrap it up, intentional. Intentional service. What have, what have we been talking about over the last few weeks, guys? We've been talking about what? Habits. And habits are intentional, designed, scheduled. We should be people because, listen, I'm, I'm like a person with a bad grocery cart wheel. Do you know what I'm talking about? Like, I just get pulled off course so easy. I have to schedule serving for me. Like, but I, I believe in this so much, and I'm, I'm going I'm to ask you to do that, to be intentional in your serving, choosing to be available. Like, if there's opportunities at work or in your community, or especially at our church, to serve, to say, sign me up. At 8 o'clock on these days, I'll, I'll be there. I'll hold babies. I'll drive the shuttle. I've always wanted to be a NASCAR driver, and I feel like I could help with that. <laughs> I'll sit up and tear down at Highlands Ranch. Like, I, I'll do that. Why? Because Jesus serves me. Jesus has done this for me. Now I want to do it for other people. So let me give you some action steps. One, pray. Lord, open my eyes. 
So many times I'm just so busy, I don't see the needs around me. Lord, open my eyes and help me to have the margin and the willingness to stop and to serve. Why? Because that's what Jesus would do. How about this? I would just encourage you, if you haven't already, go to Crash Course. Crash Course is, is, a, is a membership class for us as a church, but it's way more than that. It, it's about helping people find their gifts, their talent, their wiring, so that you can find out how you best serve. And then, this is crazy, and then start serving. Just, hey, I'm, I, I don't know if that's my gift or my calling or whatever, but I, I'll help there. Why? Because it's necessary and it's needed. And if I don't, who will? That's the posture, come on, of the people of the towel. Is to say, hey, the world is changed by those who stoop to serve. And then this is for a lot of us. Look at me. If you go to church here, I'm going to have a little pastoral moment here. Start serving again. Something happened to the church not just our church, every church, during the pandemic. We all went home. We all got in our cocoon. Everything kind of kept going. And then when we came back to attend church, so many people just never started serving again. Can I just like, as your pastor, like lovingly say, some of you, you served and you're like, oh yeah, I used to do that. I used to do that. I just want to, in the best way I know how, in the most positive, encouraging way, can I just say, we need you. S step up and start serving again. Why? Because it's a habit. It's a habit we fall into, and it's a habit we fall out of. But we are the people of the towel. So we serve. When everybody else around us goes, hey, how can I get out of that? We go, hey, I'm stepping in. Let's pray together. So right there where you are, I, I just want to remind you as, as we have a moment with God that the symbol of our faith is a cross, the ultimate picture of sacrifice and service. And to be followers of Jesus means to be servants of people. Would you right now just quietly pray, God, where do I need to serve? spontaneously and intentionally. Maybe you're here today and you say, you know what, what I need more than anything is a relationship with God. Just hearing that God loves me and will be with me. I wanna surrender my life to him. And if that's you, I just wanna ask you to maybe quietly pray something like this, just with all sincerity. Jesus, I believe in you. I believe you lived for me. You died on the cross for my sin and you rose from the grave. And the best way I know how, I surrender my life to you. Forgive me of all the things I've done wrong and help me to start following you today. In Jesus' name, everyone said, amen.